If you will, let's begin by opening up to Acts chapter 15, verse, let's start at 11. We're going to start at 11, just to catch up a little bit. But first I'm going to pray. Lord, uh, what a joy it is to picnic, to fellowship with the believers, Lord, to open your word and to devour it, Lord, and to let it enter into our hearts and to give us the nutrients and the strength that we need, Lord. It gives us the courage for each day. It gives us the wisdom that we need. It gives us the guidance and the light to direct our paths. It is everything that we need, but Lord, we can't understand it without you. So we ask you right now by your Holy Spirit to open it up to our hearts, and we look forward to what you have. We pray these things in your name. Amen. All right. Acts 15, 13. So Steve did a great job on Sunday. He did the first 13 verses there uh, in Acts. But I always feel like it's great to just stop for a second and say, all right, where are we? You know, just kind of get our landmarks again. So let me start by describing the scene. You know, wh- what is the scene that's going on? This is probably about the year 49 or 50 AD. That means after Jesus was born. And I always get that. I don't know about you guys, but I always get that messed up. Is it, is it his birth or his death? I've, I always mess that up. But it's his birth, 50 years after his birth, um, roughly. It's about 20 years since Pentecost has happened. So now, you know, we've begun the, what we'll call the church age. And we're going to talk about that some more tonight. But what does that even mean? But Jesus died was buried, was resurrected, was seen by many as a testimony to his witness and his example of, res- of redemption. And we're going to talk about redemption tonight. And then the church is born. And we know we've covered all that ground. I'm not going to cover it, but this is now 20 years after Pentecost, when the Holy Spirit descended upon the the early church, the apostles, and the early believers. Okay, so it's also about 10 years since Peter had the vision of the of the cloth with the four corners and the clean and unclean animals, if you remember that. And, and God told him, he said, don't you call unclean what I call clean. So he's, he, it was a moment in the church when basically God re-emphasized, and it was not something new, that God can bring, he, first of all, he can do anything, amen? God can do anything. But he can bring into the church the Gentiles. The Gentiles, <clears throat> who were thought to be unclean by the Israelites of the day. <coughs> And so this is 10 years later. This is not a new idea at this point, this idea about the Gentiles becoming part of the church. They they were probably not thinking of it that way. They were thinking that the Gentiles could be saved. And so this becomes a point of, of debate and discussion. And so what we find ourselves in here in Acts 15 and, and why it's worthy of our deep dive here is There's a critical juncture here, a critical junction, a time when the church is in jeopardy. Now, by the way, when we walk with the Lord, we know this. We cannot fall out of his hand. Amen. We are never in danger with the Lord. And they were not in danger either. Jesus said, look, you know, when, <laughs> when he was entering into Jerusalem, he said, look, you know, if these don't shout hallelujah, the very stones themselves will do so. Because God is not going to be thwarted. <laughs> Amen. He has plans and he's revealed those plans. And the plan for the church was a plan that he has revealed all along in the word, in the word of God, special revelation. Maybe we'll talk about general and special, but the word of God being the revelation of God's plan 
right? It was in there. However, it hadn't been made clear yet, right? And that's what we're beginning to talk about in chapter 15 and and in other places. And and that's what we're going to talk about a little bit tonight. And so God has this plan for the church and the church. I'm going to back up for one second. Sorry, I'm going to back way up. The Garden of Eden. <laughs> this is going to be a long night. You know, get, get settled. Get settled. No, not at all. Um, you know, God did the work. And then the last day he says, you know what? It is good. And he rested. Amen. And he said, let's, he said to Adam, like, this is good. Let's fellowship, you know, basically. He's like, okay. And you know, that was perfect at that point. Adam hadn't eaten the apple. There had been no sin that had entered the world. What was left for God to do at that point? Nothing. To enjoy his creation, to enjoy fellowship with Adam, for Adam to enjoy fellowship with God. We would call that the Sabbath. See, it was really the first Sabbath. And that Sabbath was meant to be forever. <laughs> that was the ultimate Sabbath rest. And we were, we were meant to just enjoy that Sabbath, that peace. Oh, you know, just enjoying that peace with God, that rest of God. But then Adam ate the apple. And now what happened? Now the work was not finished. See, the work had been finished, but now Adam ate the apple and the work is not finished. What is the work now? It's called the work of redemption. Because man had separated himself from God and now God has to do the work. He has to redeem man back to himself. I go all the way back there to say this, that plan of redemption, it involves many things, but this is the revelation of that plan. This is the story of that plan from beginning to end. That's why every word of this is juicy. (laughs) It's healthy. It's good for us because we read about God's plan. And no matter how many times man tries to thwart his plan, whether by desire or by rebellion or by ignorance or whatever, by pride and by sin, no matter how many times God, a man tries to thwart that God does not allow it. The very stones themselves will cry out. See, God's plan will not be thwarted. It will not be. And we can rest in that. We can rest in that. And so the plan has many aspects to it. And all those aspects were not known all throughout. But when the church age came, when Jesus had paid that price, and now there was a price that could be paid and and could be accepted. Now we just entered a new age, and that was the age of the church, but it wasn't 100% clear. And at that time, all of the focus, all of, in a sense, all of the, the focus in, in a way, if you will, and this is probably a bad way to say this, had been on the the children of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. You know, God had just, at least as far as the writings of the Bible go, the Old Testament, really it focuses on them. And, uh, and rightly so, they, they, they got an attitude that, you know, we are in effect the chosen people because they were, and they are, they still are. They still are. Let me say that again. They still are. (laughs) Netanyahu was, speaking today. They still are. So let's not, we must not forget that. So, okay. Uh, All of this is leading to say this. Where are we? We are 50 years after, uh, 50 years AD, 20 years after the uh, Pentecost, 10 years after Peter and Cornelius. The idea of the Gentiles entering the church uh, has become part of the debate. Let me start in verse 11. Steve did such an awesome job. And this verse is so powerful. I want to say it again. 
but we believe this is Peter. Now he's speaking. Yeah, you know, I forgot to set that part up. Right. So where are we? We're in Jerusalem, the end of the first missionary journey. Paul, by the way, the first missionary journey was said to be Barnabas and Saul. Right. Barnabas and Saul. This was before Paul was a Paul <laughs> before Paul. And what I mean by that is before Paul was the guy we know, he he wasn't someone that was known like we know him. Uh, he wasn't, you know, renowned. Um, so Barnabas and Saul go on their first missionary journey and they, they make this little loop. And if you've seen the, the four missionary journeys of Paul, good to study those routes. It's good to get your map out and really look at those. But the first one's fairly modest. They make this little loop. They don't go as far as Tarsus, which of course is where Paul is from. And then they loop back. Right. And it's a, probably about, from what I understand, 600 miles or so one way. 600 miles is a long way to go. And then they come back 600 miles. So it was quite a journey and it took it took some time. So they've done that. They've come back. They saw miracles and many of those miracles were the Gentiles getting saved. OK, that's where we are. Now, they've come together. What has happened? The Judaizers, these are Jewish leaders who have been saved, but they still have the old way of thinking in a sense. The Judaizers, that's not a nice term. It just doesn't sound very nice. I wouldn't want to be called a Judaizer. You know, it just sounds bad. You know, and in part, in part, it's good. I mean, in part, I should say it's right that it should sound bad is what I mean, because what they were doing is this. They were thinking the old way. And what they thought was, and, and by the way, the, the critical juncture that I mentioned that we're at here is not what you think the critical juncture is, or at least not what I generally would have thought it was. The critical juncture in the church at this moment is not the question of whether the Gentiles should be in the church. That is not the critical juncture. That issue's been dealt with. And we're gonna, that's what we're gonna talk about in just a second. The critical juncture is this. Do they have to be Jews before they can be saved? That's the critical juncture. So now Peter says, but we believe that through the grace, the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, we shall be saved in the same manner as they. So he's speaking to the Jewish men, leaders of that time. They had gathered in Jerusalem. It was a council. Steve covered all this. It was awesome. And he says to them, not they can be saved just like us. This is so sweet. It's like if I said, we're walking along and we find someone and they're on the street and, and they're not in a good condition. And I said to my friend, my good friend, I said, hey, Joe, I've got great news for you. You can be saved just like him. See, that, that's the kind of the vibe here. The vibe is this. Peter is saying, you Jewish people here who, who think that you are the chosen and you are, but you've let that go to your head, you can be saved too. That's what he says. He says the Gentiles are getting saved. You can be saved too. <laughs> I love it. God has this way of humbling us. So he goes on. Then all the multitudes kept silent. Oh, no. Yes. Yeah. Uh, and listened to Barnabas and Paul declaring how many miracles and wonders God had worked through them among the Gentiles. So we're in this council. One testimony has been given. Peter speaks about his vision with Cornelius. He speaks about the work, uh, uh, the message that God gives him about the Gentiles. Now, the second, so that's one testimony. 
there's going to be three testimonies. The second testimony is this. Barnabas and Saul, (laughs) Paul and Barnabas, they now recount all these amazing signs and wonders that occurred to them while they were journeying through their mission, right? Through their, their trip. Signs and wonders. God uses signs and wonders. He uses them to confirm his word. And in this case, it's the second testimony. The first is, the first is Peter, who was given revelation by God. The second is signs and wonders. And now in a moment, we're going to see the third is the word itself. The word itself is going to be the third witness. And so he says uh, that we had worked, um, uh, we had kept, uh, then all the multitude kept silent. Boy, I, I imagine, right? So these stories had to be awesome. I love it when, in fact, our kids right now are out doing mission work. Don't you love it when they come back and they all line up up here and then they start giving testimonies? It's exciting. It's important. It's important that we share those signs and wonders, those miracles that God does, and he still does. And we're going to hear some. I'm confident of that. Because the Holy Spirit is just as much at work today as he has ever been, maybe more, who knows. And so miracles are happening. And if you say, well, mm, I don't know, I, don't, I never see any, mm, pray. Pray that God will open your eyes. And you'll start to see the miracles. So the miracles are happening. They testify. It's awesome. It had to be exciting. It was so exciting that everybody shut up. They're like, wow. I I imagine their minds were blown listening to this. This is the first missionary journey. Now, we just sit there and we know all about the four missionary journeys. And and we know all the stories Paul is going to tell and has told and all that. So to us, it's okay. So to them, this is the first. This is the first one. This is the first time they're hearing all these, these things that are happening that, that happened to Paul and, and to Barnabas in this journey. And like, they have to be blown away. I mean, I'm blown away when I read it even now. And so to, be, to hear it for the first time, it's like, really? You, you're, you're kidding. That happened? That happened? That happened? So they're blown away. And after they had become silent, James answered saying, Men and brethren, listen to me. Now, the first thing that occurs to me is, what in the world is James doing here? (laughs) Like, what James is this and and where did he come from, right? Because we've been talking about Peter, we've been talking about Paul, Barnabas we know, we know a lot of names. Where where, where did this name come from all of a sudden? And so it's important we take a moment on that, right? So, So this is James. There are many James in the Bible, but this is the James that is the, I'll say, half brother of Jesus, right? He he has the same mom, not the same dad, as it were, you know, Jesus being born of the Holy Spirit. But uh, James, who grew up with an older brother who was the Messiah. (laughs) That's who we're looking at here, James. And, and, And so the question is, why is he taking a lead in this conversation? Where, where does he come from and why is it that they're listening to him? Well, you know, a couple little facts here. So first of all, James Eusebius, and, and I am no scholar of these things, but a, a few things I found. Eusebius was a um, historian uh, born like in about 240, lived th- into the 300s AD. So not a whole lot longer after this time period. This is a 50 AD, 150 years later, 100, maybe 200 years later, comes a historian. And that historian tells us a little bit about James. And he says that he was called Camel Knees. And I checked this, and at least what I can tell, it seems to be true. I mean, that he reported this. Um, because he would spend eight to 10 hours a day in prayer. And his knees had just become misshapen. And if you've ever seen a camel, that is definitely not a flattering statement (laughs) to be called camel knees because camels have these gnarly knees. Like if you've ever seen them and they kind of go in a funky way. He had camel knees from the amount of time he prayed. Now, 
Yeah. We pray a few minutes a day. I confess to you, I pray relatively little compared to that. I'm working on it. I'm sure we all are. And I know I'm blessed the more I do. But he prayed eight to 10 hours a day, so much so that he was misshapen. So number one, if, if there were no other qualification, that would be enough in my opinion. But he was the half brother of Jesus. He grew up with Jesus. And I imagine that he spent his time in prayer talking to his older brother. (laughs) What a beautiful thing. Hey, brother. Hey, hey Jesus. I got some more stuff I got to lay on you. I need to talk to you. Just like they talked, I imagine so much when Jesus was still on the earth. I I gotta believe that they spoke together Older brother to younger brother. What a beautiful thing. And, and James never stopped. He just kept going. So he's now a leader in the church. He writes the first epistle that we have in the Bible. At least the best they can date. Um, the epistle of James was written the earliest of the epistles, except for one that we're about to look at. The epistle right here in Acts. (laughs) That's actually the first epistle, as far as I could tell. And then James, the book of James, is is the next, is the first standalone epistle in the Bible, which is interesting to me. I don't know if it's interesting to you, but I find that interesting and, and significant because not only was is his perspective so fascinating? Having been the, you know, the brother, if you will, having lived in the same household and watched Jesus his whole life, that gives him an, a unique and fascinating perspective. So I read James with, with fascination of like, okay, here's the guy that knew him. But also that it was first is significant. How did that happen? How, how did it come that he decided... I'm going to write an epistle. <laughs> I'm going to write a, a letter out, a big one, and, and capture it and send it about. So he goes on, says, um, he says, Simon has declared how God at the first visited the Gentiles to take them out of a people for his name. So He's taking a people out of the Gentiles. Now, the Jews thought they were the people of God. And so this is another one of those little twists where uh, he's saying, look, you know, the people came out of the Gentiles in this case. And with this, the words of the prophets agree, just as it is written. And now he's going to quote Amos, the prophet Amos. So the question is kind of, you know, what is the church, the mystery of the church? It's going to be revealed. And we're, we're, as they're, they are living through it, it's becoming apparent to them. The issue of the Gentiles actually has been resolved, <clears throat> but there's still much more mystery. I'm going to jump quickly to Ephesians 3. It says this, Ephesians 3, 1. For this reason, this is Paul writing, I, Paul, the prisoner of Christ Jesus, for you Gentiles, If indeed you have heard of the dispensation of the grace of God, which was given to me for you. I'm going to say how, how that by revelation, he made known to me the mystery as I have briefly written already by which you, when you read, you may understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ, which in other ages was not made known to the sons of men as it has now been revealed by the Spirit to his holy apostles and prophets. He's talking about this mystery and how it had been written, but hadn't been understood. And now it's being made known. It's being made known that the Gentiles should be fellow heirs of the same body and partakers of his promise in Christ through the gospel of which I became a minister according to the gift of the grace of God given to me by the effective working of his power to me who am less than the, le- than the least of all the saints, this grace, this grace was given 
that I should preach among the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ and to make all see what is the fellowship of the mystery which from the beginning of the ages has been hidden in God who created all things through Christ Jesus. There was this mystery. It was there and we see it. He's about to quote Amos. Amos was, had been Amos was a prophet from many hundreds of years earlier. These prophecies had been there. Isaiah 10 verses, or 11 verse 10, excuse me. I'm, I'm not going to go because time is flying. But in Isaiah, many others. In fact, Isaiah, most, in, in some ways, most clearly uh, announced many of these things. And if you choose to, Isaiah 11, 12, 35, those chapters... They're declaring these mysteries. Um, but they weren't understood is what Paul is saying. They weren't understood because the Holy Spirit needed to make them clear. And so that's what's happening here. Um, the Holy Spirit is making them clear. Now, the problem that they're dealing with, once again, is the Judaizer. So what had happened? So the Gentiles are, becoming, are being saved. Along come these men, these Jewish leaders, who felt rightly so that they knew much better than the Gentiles. They were more educated in the ways of God. Right? We need to all be careful when we start to feel that way. And there's many people who teach and preach today, and they're going to tell you that they're more educated in the ways of God than you are. <laughs> and they're going to reveal to you some new things that, that were hidden in the word of God. They were mysteries. But, but they, these teachers today, uh, false teachers, by the way, uh, are going to declare to you these mysteries. And we need to be very careful when we hear that kind of language and, and when we hear those kinds of things, because really all that is is pride and men trying to control other men and using God to try to do that. And woe to you, woe to you when you try to use God for your purposes and to lord it over someone. So that happens today. The Judaizers, I believe personally, at least to some degree, again, remember, these are saved these are saved Jewish men and women. So these are J the Judaizers themselves are saved Jewish leaders, men of the church. I believe that they had humbled themselves. They are saved. That means that they have given their lives over to the Lord. The Lord has accepted that. So I don't think that they're coming in maliciously. I don't think they're coming in to try to necessarily lord it over anyone. I think what they're coming in to do is simply try to teach these guys because they think that they know how things should work. And in one sense, it kind of makes sense what they're saying. Because what they're saying is this. Look, we know the Old Testament. We know all the writings of God. We know these things, and these are the things God has declared. And in a sense, I, I suspect that they were thinking, we're going to teach you as well. But they didn't understand. Not yet. They hadn't understood completely. And so what happens is this kind of uh, legalism. And so here comes this real crisis of the church. And that real crisis is this, circumcision. They come in to the Gentiles. Again, just the first missionary journey, this is still, the church is in its infancy. And they're still trying to understand a lot of these things. And they come along, these Judaizers, and they say, look, you know, um, to be the chosen, to be called out ones in their mind, this is their mind, you need to be circumcised. And, and there is, I can see how they could have that logic. Um, not only that, but they probably were going to begin to lay on them other rules too. And so what they're really saying is this. 
to be part of the work of this church, of this new work of God, you need to first be Jews. That's what they're saying. First, you need to be Jews. You need to be proselytes. See, because they already had a mechanism for this. They, they already had this, and Steve talked about this too. They already had this process where Gentiles could come into the you know, Jewish church, if you will, the, Jew, the Jewish religion uh, as proselytes. Circumcision was part of that. And then learning the dietary laws and then learning all the other laws and the laws on the laws and the other, you know, the writings of men and all these other things that they needed to learn to become righteous enough in their minds to be uh, chosen by God. Now, God, at this very critical juncture in the church, is going to clean that up. He's going to explain some things. I need to be super careful. I don't want anyone to get me wrong. God did say a lot of that to the children of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, to the Israelites. They did have, God had laid out and proscribed many things for them to follow. And they are a chosen people and they still have a place in God's plan. They still do. But those who are saved into the church are set free from the law, right? Grace, that word grace, Peter used it. Grace, the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, it sets us free from the law. And that's what they're learning. And you know, <clears throat> I genuinely believe they took this with a good heart because they are saved and they're probably just, their minds are just blowing up. And they're like, what? What? I can't grok this, you know? My brain can't wrap itself around these thoughts. But with the help of God, I'm sure that they did. You know, today, <clears throat> so often we'll say things like, or I'll hear things said, and I'll probably think them myself on occasion, Oh, Lord, you know, I, I, I mean, why is it that those guys have it so easy and, and I can't go to R-rated movies, you know, I, I can't curse, I can't, I can't do all the fun stuff, you know what I mean? I can't, I can't do all the things, by the way, I don't really think this, but, you know, I'm sure there are people. Uh, we think that and we hear that and, you know, f from well-meaning people sometimes our children. <laughs> and they say, well, why can't we? And, and, and the answer to that, because, they, because the Judaizers themselves could, say, could have said this, well, then why did we have to get circumcised? <laughs> now, by the way, that happened for them before they got saved. But, but the answer to that question in my mind is not, why do we have to not go to movies? that we know we shouldn't go to, by the way. Th that's not the question. The statement is, thank you, Lord, for letting me not. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's not, why do I not get to? It's, why do I get to avoid that? Uh, let me say that a different way. We should celebrate the fact that we are different. See, God made the children of Israel set them apart. And they had circumcision as a sign of being set apart unto God. It was a physical mark on their body. <laughs> but they also had many practices and habits, dietary, many other things that set them apart. Clothing, what they would wear, the, their, their practices of their lives. They, they set them apart we should say the same thing today. We shouldn't avoid those things. We shouldn't say, oh boy, I'm glad I can live just like everyone else. <laughs> that, that's not a blessing. We should be rejoicing that there are ways that we can be different, that we can be set apart, the church, that we can be distinguished from the world. And we should seek those things with all of our heart.
All right. So he goes on <clears throat> in verse uh, 16. He's going to quote Amos. And he says, after this, I will return and I will rebuild the tabernacle of David, which has fallen down. And so this, this quote is, is from the Septuagint version. And uh, he talks about rebuilding the tabernacle of David. What that really means is um, reestablishing or establishing the house of David because there had been a Davidic covenant, a, a covenant between God and David. And he said to David, look, there shall not fail to sit on the throne, one from your house. And, and so it was like, well, well, how's that going to happen? And uh, Amos, many hundreds of years before this, wrote, after this, I will rebuild. And this is by the inspiration of God. And I will rebuild the tabernacle. I will reestablish the house of David. How did he do that? He did it through the son of David many generations down, <laughs> Jesus, the Messiah. He brought the Messiah and they knew this. This was a well understood thing to, to the Jews of this day, that, that, that this, uh, this was a reference to the Messiah. And he says, I will rebuild its ruins and I will set it up so that the rest of mankind may seek the Lord. In other words, He's going to do a mighty miracle, which he did do. He reestablished the lineage and the throne of David in the Messiah, Jesus, who is seated on that throne. The root of Jesse, Jesse being da uh, D King David's father, the root of Jesse, that lineage through Jesse, through David, now the Messiah, Jesus. He, God has done this. It's a miracle and it is a testimony to the world. <laughs> so that is one way we are set apart. We worship a king and his kingdom has been from everlasting, meaning before anything ever existed. His kingdom has always been and always will be. And he is the king and he sits on the throne. And it's only because of that we have this grace wherein we walk. This grace wherein we can celebrate and rejoice and be thankful. And so he goes on, he says, even all the Gentiles who are called by my name, says the Lord who does all these things. Known to God from eternity are all his works. Yeah. So in other words, God is not surprised at any of this. Uh, God has known what he plans to do and he has done it. And he's going to continue to do it. There's more yet. So then he goes on. Therefore, I judge that we should not trouble those from among the Gentiles who are turning to God. Uh, but that we write to them to abs. Now he's going to he's going to list some things here. All right, so number one, there's this thing, liberty in Christ. And that's what we've been kind of talking about tonight. Uh, Jesus died, and it's by the grace that he showed us that we can be saved, and by his grace alone, right? By grace and grace alone. By faith in Christ, by repentance and acceptance of that price, right? We know all these things. And by the way, if there's anyone here that doesn't, if you're struggling with that, and if the burdens of this world and the burdens of this life are heavy on your shoulders, remember what Jesus said. He said, come to me, all you who are weary and heavily burdened. James is going to say that word burdened here in a moment. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me for I am gentle and humble and you will find rest for your souls. Take my yoke upon you. So that's what you must do. He doesn't say get circumcised, eat according to the dietary laws. He doesn't say those things. He says one simple thing, come to me and take my yoke upon you and learn from me. We, get, we are saved when we come to the Lord, the King of kings, the poorest king that ever lived and the richest. The poorest king that ever walked this earth, he had nothing. 
but the king who owned everything. (laughs) He owned the very earth that he walked on. He had created it. He could create whatever he needed, but he walked as the poorest king. And so we follow him. He is the only answer. He is the only way to be set free from your burdens. James says, therefore I judge that we should not trouble these Gentiles who are turning to God, but, and now he's going to say something. He says, but that we write to them this, to abstain from things that are polluted by idols, from sexual immorality, from things strangled and from blood. Well, you know, when I read that the first time, I thought, boy, that's kind of odd, you know, because we know that in Christ, we have liberty. So I was, in a way, it's sort of surprising that he actually puts a list of things that they're going to tell them not to do. And yet when you read it, it becomes almost infinitely clear. This is an odd set of things too, by the way. There's two commandments there. One is, thou shalt not worship any idol before me. In other words, uh, don't have idols. And they say here that they should abstain from things polluted by idols. We'll talk, if we have time, we'll get to that. It says from sexual immorality. In other words, don't commit adultery. Don't, don't do, and the word is pornea, pornaya. uh, And, and that really means pretty much any kind of sexual immorality. It means a lot of kinds of sexual immorality. And this world at this time, this Gentile world that they're sending this letter to is just filled with it. And then he says, from things strangled and from blood. Interesting, those two, very interesting. There's two commands and there's two, in a sense, prohibitions saying, don't worship idols and don't, and be and uh, and avoid. He says, abstain from those things that are polluted by idols, and from sexual sexual immorality, from things strangled, and from blood. Why? Okay. Some people could have said or thought in their minds, it's possible to say, why are you laying on me this burden? Why do I have any rule? Why is there a rule here? I, I, I thought I was supposed to be able to follow Christ in perfect liberty. You are. <laughs> But we all know this, right? I think it was Augustine. I probably got it wrong and Steve can fix me some other day when he's up here uh, that said, look, you know what? Love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength and then do whatever you want. It really is that easy. It really is that simple and it really is that clear. If you love the Lord with all of your heart, with all of your soul, with all of your mind, with all of your strength, if you love him like that, do whatever you want because you are only going to want to please him. You're only going to want to make him proud of you in that sense. You're only going to want to be in his good favor. You're only going to ever want to see him smile upon you. (laughs) And so there's a list of a few things here. You know what? We could probably add a hundred more. A hundred more. Don't go to R-rated movies. <laughs> I'm throwing that one out there. If you, need, if you feel the liberty to go to R-rated movies, please do. I, I'm just using that as an example of something that, you know, have I ever seen one? Of course I have. And, I, and so maybe that was a bad example. And, and please forgive me. I probably did pick a bad example there because <laughs> there's probably many that are just fine. Um, you know a movie that you shouldn't be at when you're at it and you see it and you go, I got to leave. And it doesn't have to do with whether it has R on it. It has to do with what's in it. You know what I mean? And so please understand 